Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ at Northgate Bible Chapel. It's a privilege this morning to bring the word to you uh, from Revelation chapter 20. Um, the, the topic of today's message is going to be the Millennial Kingdom or the Millennial Reign of Christ. Turn with me, if you would, to Revelation chapter 20, verse 1 to 6. Although we are going to be uh, looking uh, at this passage, uh, we will be in various portions of scriptures uh, to understand God's plan for the kingdom age um, through the Old Testament and the New Testament. And then we will briefly look at uh, the verses that are before us today. Revelation chapter 20, verse 1 to 6. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the witness, their witness to Jesus, and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. We have arrived at one of the greatest sections of the book of Revelation, chapters 20 to 22. In the midst of the pandemic, periods of lockdown and isolation and news of thousands of deaths per day uh, at its peak, there is no better hope for the saints than to rest in the promises of the Lord regarding the future reign of Christ with his saints on the earth. A kingdom with no sicknesses or sorrow, a kingdom marked by perfect justice. As we embark on Revelation chapter 20, it would be helpful to quickly get a glimpse or recap of uh, the eschatological plan of, of God uh, through the book of Revelation and through his scriptures up to this point. We see the church age in which we are today, uh, 2,000 years back when our Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary. He made way for the church age, uh, the period of grace wherein we are today. We who are bought by the blood of the Lamb, uh, uh, looking forward to that glorious day when he shall come to take us unto himself, putting aside all eschatological interpretations of the future kingdom and the timings therein, uh, there is one thing that binds every born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ together, and that is the blessed hope of the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18, we read, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. After the, after the rapture of the church, uh, for the church uh, will not see this age of desolation that is about to embark from an eschatological timeline standpoint. We see the tribulation period coming about. Uh, the seven years uh, wherein uh, the, the, uh, wherein uh, the people uh, wherein Israel uh, will see through it all uh, the one, the Savior, uh, who had come the first time round. 
now with the church, the bride of Christ, the bridegroom, uh, with the bridegroom, uh, there comes upon the earth dwellers, as Jeremiah would call it, the times of Jacob's trouble or the tribulation period. This is the time when Israel would be tried as they were tried in the wilderness when they complained against Moses. We read in Numbers chapter 21, the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people and so will it be in the day of the tribulation. In Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7, we read, Alas, for the day is great, so that none is like it. And it is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. But just as the Lord made provision for those bitten by, to be saved by gazing at the bronze fiery serpent on the pole and live, uh, we read, in one of my most favorite passages in Zechariah, in Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10, a verse of restoration where we read like this, He will pour out His Spirit upon the house of David. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one, for, one mourns for his own son, only son, and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. After the tribulation period, at the end thereof, we see the second advent of Christ. And that is where uh, we left off in Revelation chapter 19, where Satan and his emissaries, the beast and the false prophets and his armies are destroyed, leading to the binding of Satan himself. The defeat of the Antichrist, the binding of Satan for a thousand years, wherein is chapter 20. Uh, where Satan is bound for a thousand years in the abyss in the bottomless pit. We see the first resurrection and the millennial reign of Christ for a thousand years, wherein uh, we are today in Revelation chapter 20. We see the release of Satan at the end of the millennial period, and then we see the white throne judgment, the second death, wherein Satan and his emissaries are judged and cast into the, the lake of fire. And then we see a perpetuation of uh, the millennial kingdom, uh, the new heavens and the new earth. So what is referred to as the kingdom plan? So many a times we as saints uh, hear about the kingdom being preached and, 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 and the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of earth uh, being talked about a lot. Uh, and when you look at the eschatological studies, you will see the kingdom mentioned very often. What is referred to as this kingdom? In the New Testament usage of the word uh, kingdom is the word basilia. Uh, and it focuses not on the people, not on the subjects, uh, but focuses on the reign rather than the people. The primary focus is on the royal power or the kingship or the king. Uh, the focus is on the dominion, on the rule, rather than on the subjects. So the kingdom refers to God's kingly rule and sovereignty over all beings in heaven or on earth who are willing subjects to God in the exercise of his sovereignty. All throughout the history of mankind, we see glimpses of the kingdom plan of God in the Old Testament and also in the New Testament. And what I'd like to do quick, quickly today is go through a couple of passages in the Old Testament and in the New Testament uh, and to reveal or, sh or to show forth what Scriptures has to say uh, about God's plan for the Kingdom Age. And we see that in, in all, or if not all, of the minor prophets as well as the major prophets uh, prophetic books are within, within our holy scriptures. The challenge to God's eternal sovereign right to rule is seen in Ezekiel chapter 28, and that's where it starts. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 11 to 19. Uh, when you get a chance, I would recommend that you read through it. And also we see a par parallel passage in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 to 17. And uh, in that passage, we see Lucifer's sin. Lucifer uh, sinned against the Lord God of heaven in the five awful eye wills against the will of God. 
we see various aspects or five aspects of the one sin of Lucifer. He says, I will ascend into the heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Each aspect of the I wills of Satan was an act of rebellion against the constituted authority of God and was motivated by a covetous desire to appropriate that very sovereignty for himself. Because of this sin, which brought about the fall of Satan, a kingdom over which Satan rules was formed in opposition to the kingdom over which God rules. Satan, we read today in, in, uh, in the New Testament, is the god of this present age. He is the prince of the power of the air. He is the spirit who now works in the children of disobedience. And Satan has carried out his work to defeat God's purpose and program of God since the beginning of times. However, God instituted a program to manifest his sovereignty before all created intelligences. In Matthew chapter 25, if you will turn with me to Matthew chapter 25 and verse 34, we read like this, The Lord says, Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the basilian, the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. True theocracy was established at the time of creation, I would say. When God recognized, was recognized as sovereign and the sovereignty that belonged to God was delegated to man, to Adam and Eve. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 and verse 28, we read, uh, Let them have dominion. Fill the earth and subdue it. Man was given the full authority, uh, the delegated authority uh, to have dominion, uh, to subdue the earth. When sin entered, it was man saying no to the sovereign rule of God in his disobedience uh, against the king. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 4, we see the serpent telling the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in that day you eat of, its, uh, eat of, uh, of it, your eyes uh, will be opened. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. In the rejection of this theocratic authority of God by man, God announced the inception of a program that would manifest his authority by bringing a new creation into existence through the seed of the woman. Uh, the seed of the woman that would be willingly subject to himself. This authority would be manifested through the plan of redemption and the re-establishment of that theo theocracy under, his, under, un, un, under him. Uh, and that was God's primary purpose. However, man under the influence of God uh, of this world continues to challenge God's sovereignty. Uh, it just did not end uh, right there in the Garden of Eden, but rather it was the beginning of, of man challenging God's sovereignty. The establishment of the kingdom of Nimrod, we read in Genesis at, at Babel. In Genesis chapter 11 and verse 4, we read, Come, let us build. Let us make a name for ourselves. The prophecy of the re-establishment program of the theocratic kingdom was given uh, to the Old Testament patriarchs uh, through the words of Jacob in his death, on his deathbed. We read uh, Jacob saying in Genesis chapter 40 and verse 10, The scepter, the, which is the emblem of regal authority, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver, from between his feet until Shiloh, or the Messiah of the lineage of Judah, comes and to him shall be the obedience of the people. Moses, in God's plan for the establishment of his kingdom, as God's appointed authority, or uh, God's appointed theocratic representative uh, to the Israelites, God could say this uh, 
of the coming ruler. In Genesis chapter 18 and verse 18 we read, I will rise up for them a prophet like you, or talking about Moses, from among their brethren, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. Israel, in murmuring against Moses, was murmuring against God's appointed representative in the theocratic administration. Israel, however, uh, under the judges, uh, God's theocratic representatives again, uh, did what was right in their own eyes, we read in the book of Judges, uh, rejecting the theocratic, uh, the, the theocratic kingdom or the theocratic rule of God uh, for that of man. They rather chose man than God, who was their theocratic ruler. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 6 to 7, we read like this, But this thing, in, in that they, they chose a man versus God, uh, but this thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. God used Israel's kings for the administration and establishment of his theocratic kingdom. God enters uh, into an eternal, unconditional covenant with King David in 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 16. And you read over there, And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. God guaranteed that uh, the Davidic kingdom should be a kingdom in which the, theocra the theocratic kingdom should come uh, to full realization as one from David's lineage would reign forever. The future theocratic kingdom is a major theme of nearly every prophet of the Old Testament. And turn with me, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 5 to 6. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 5 to 6. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our Righteousness. In the New Testament, not just in the Old Testament, but rather also in the New Testament, uh, we see uh, God's kingdom plan. The Jews at the time of Christ Jesus were anticipating the literal fulfillment of the theocratic kingdom promises. They were waiting for the Messiah to come and to establish his kingdom uh, according to the promises that were laid out by the prophets of the Old Testament. Christ at his birth was announced as the Messiah by the angelic messengers announcing his birth to Mary would say in Luke chapter 1 and verse 31 to 33, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom, Basilia, there will be no end. John the Baptist, the forerunner, uh, would say in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 2, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The Lord Jesus Christ himself would announce in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 17, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The authenticity of the kingdom offer was established by signs and miracles that the Lord Jesus Christ performed. When John the Baptist sent his disciples from prison to ask Jesus, they, he sent his disciples to ask Jesus this in Matthew chapter 11 verse 3 to 4, Are you the coming one? Or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he 
who is not offended because of me. The signs given by Christ were evidences of the power that would reside in the theocratic king, the manifestation of the blessings that would exist in the kingdom. The rightful king was present in their midst, and all that was required of the people was repentance. Repentance on the part of the nation and a wholehearted reception of Christ as their theocratic messiah. It was conditioned on one and only one thing, on a repentant heart. The Transfiguration uh, was a revelation of the coming of the Son of, uh, Son of Man in glory. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 27, uh, it was a miniature picture of the coming of the Messiah in His glory to establish His kingdom. When you look at it from a kingdom plan or kingdom program standpoint, a new program since Israel now had rejected their king. Turn with me to uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16 to 18. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 16 to 18, we read like this. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came from to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain, talking about Peter, James, and John, when they were uh, on the mount and when Jesus was transfigured. And we read over here, when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this transfiguration was a picture of the coming of the Son of Man in His glory. After His transfiguration, the disciples asked the Lord Jesus, Why then do you, your scribes say that Elijah must come first? Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and he will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already. Again, this is talking about John the Baptist. And they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at, his, uh, at their hands. So we see here the rejected king. The king came, uh, the king preached the kingdom of heaven, uh, the king was rejected. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 37, uh, we see the rightful king, the Lord Jesus Christ, lamenting over his rejection by the nation of Israel. He came to his own, we read, and his own received him not. We read in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 37, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones, those who are sent to her, how often I have I wanted to gather your children together, as hens gather her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. And that was the theme. They were not willing. The kingdom now that is rejected by Israel, by rejected by uh, his very own, is now offered uh, to the Gentiles. The kingdom is taken and given to the Gentiles. In Matthew chapter 21, turn with me to Matthew chapter 21 uh, and verse 42 to 43. In Matthew 21, verse 42 to 43, you read like this. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God the Basilia of God will be taken from you, uh, from Israel, from the Jewish nation, and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. The kingdom, which by promise belonged exclusively to the Jewish nation, the rightful seed of Abraham, has now been extended to the Gentiles, you and me, by his grafting. John the Baptist would say this, to the Pharisees and the Sadducees in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 8, therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance and do not think to say to yourself, 
we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And indeed, he has raised up children unto Abraham. It's the the hard-hearted stones, the Gentiles, are uh, us redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. So God raises up a seed unto Abraham out of the Gentiles by the engrafting of them into uh, the wine uh, through the faith in Christ Jesus. And what is the uh, status of the, uh, the kingdom in the present age? During the present age, while the king is absent, uh, in the sense that this world is under the sway of the wicked one, uh, the theocratic kingdom is in waiting mode in the sense of its actual establishment on the earth. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13, we read, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood and forgiveness of sins. He has conveyed us into the basilia of the Son of His love, into the kingdom of the Son of His love. He's a covenant-keeping God, and so we see the theocratic kingdom being re-offered to Israel. In Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14, we read that the gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all nations. And this, again, uh, in Matthew chapter 24, we see the Olivet Discourse. We see uh, the time of the tribulation period. Uh, and in that we read, uh, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. This preaching of the kingdom uh, through the believing uh, sealed remnant uh, during the tribulation period in Revelation chapter uh, in, Re in Revelation chapter seven. Uh, the 144,000 of all the tribes of Israel, uh, as well as through the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11, mark the final steps in the realization of the theocratic program of God. So this preaching of the kingdom uh, is now offered to all that are in the world during the time of the tribulation through the witness of the 144,000 that are sealed and through the witness of the two witnesses from Re Revelation chapter 11. The angelic sounds uh, herald the commencement of the theocratic millennial kingdom in Revelation chapter 11. Uh, turn with me to Revelation chapter 11 and verse 15. We read like this, the Basilia, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our, God, of, of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. So you see God's plan through the ages, throughout the history of mankind, past, present, and future. We see glimpses of the kingdom plan of God in the Old Testament and in the New, in the establishment of a kingdom under the sovereign reign, under his sovereign reign. And that has been his desire. Now, uh, when we look at the, the word millennium, uh, it's about a time period. Uh, it is the Latin equivalent or Latin word for a thousand years. Very simple. A thousand years is what millennium means. And it's explicitly mentioned six times uh, in, in, in the book of Revelation in chapter 20 from verses 1 to 7. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 1 to 3, we, we read uh, of Satan's relationship or the relation of Satan to the millennial kingdom, uh, the relation of Satan to uh, the kingdom plan of God. And what is that? Uh, where is Satan uh, during the millennial kingdom? I tell you this, that there can be no millennial kingdom until Satan, when Satan is at large. There can be no millennial kingdom when Satan is at large. He has to be bound. We see an angel here in Revelation chapter 20, uh, and the angel renders Satan completely inactive. 
uh, Satan, the god of this present age, the prince of the power of the air, uh, has carried on his work to defeat the purposes and programs of God from the beginning of times, as we have seen uh, all the way from, um, the, from creation, from the creation of Adam and Eve, uh, all the way to the present age and even in, in a future day. He is the master deceiver of the church today. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 14, we read that Satan is declared to be transformed into an angel of light thereby deceiving the church through false teachers. Satan is not bound today in this present, uh, in this present age. Uh, Satan is a lion on the loose, so to speak. The capstone of his activity is seen in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, we read like this, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Instead of being bound, he is a lion on the loose, seeking prey to devour. He sure seems successful as we look around right here in North America. He is more active than ever before all across the globe. Satan in this future day that is uh, shown forth in Revelation chapter 20 is, is not merely going to be restricted uh, by this angel. Uh, but he's going to be rendered completely inactive. And how does this angel bring about that? We read of the key and we read of the great chain in the hands of the, in the hand of the angel. We read about the key. This key in the hand of the angel, this key which has a victorious connotation to it and proclaims the authority of the one that uses it, uh, uses this key to incarcerate, uh, to bind Satan for a thousand years. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18, we read, Christ Jesus has the keys of Hades and of death. The key is rightfully Christ Jesus's because of his triumphant death. We read, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I'm alive evermore. Christ Jesus. Satan received his death sentence through Christ's finished work on the cross. Satan looked at it as success when Christ died on the cross of Calvary. But that very thing that he looked on as success from his perspective was his death sentence. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14, we read like this, that through death he might destroy him who had power of death, that is the devil. Through death, he might destroy him who had the power of the death. We see the chain. The same word for chain that is used in Revelation chapter 20 is, is the word that is used in Mark chapter 5 and verse 3 of the demon-possessed man uh, dwelling among the tombs in the country of the Gadarenes. One who was bound with shackles and chains. Ah. Uh, Literal chain, and this is the same word chain that is used in Revelation chapter 20 for the binding of Satan. This demon-possessed man, uh, where chains could not bind him, but Satan's demons can break the chains of man all right, can break the chains of this man who is possessed uh, by Satan himself all right. But this chain in Revelation chapter 20 will be an unbreakable chain. There are six functions that the angel performs here. We read that he lays hold, he binds, he casts Satan into the bottomless pit, he shuts up using the key to lock up the pit, and then not just lock up the pit, but he also seals or set a seal on him. And then the last of the last, we read that he is released after the thousand years. So we see uh, the six aspects or functions of the angel in this passage. Now, Jesus Christ uh, was, after, after his death on the cross of Calvary, he was put in the tomb. 
uh, we read that the Pharisees came to Pilate. The Pharisees came to Pilate and said, make sure that uh, the, the tomb in which he is is sealed secure because they remembered the words of the Lord Jesus Christ when he was on the earth saying that in three days he will rise. So what, what did Pilate instruct the Roman soldiers to do? Uh, to roll the stone uh, and to set a seal on the stone. Similarly, uh, over here we see uh, Satan uh, and sa Satan are being locked up in a pit and, and, and a seal being set on him, so to speak. Uh, contrary to what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the seal that was on the tomb could not hold him. Death could not hold him. Uh, but the seal that is set on Satan, uh, he is going to be sealed and this will be an unbreakable seal. This binding of Satan is prophesied in Isaiah chapter 24. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 24, verse 21 to 22. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will punish on high the hosts of the exalted ones, and on the earth the kings of the earth. They will be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in a pit, and will be shut up in prison. After many days, they will be punished. And in verse 23 of Isaiah chapter 24, uh, solidifies the prophetic period in which this is to happen. Uh, for in verse 23, we uh, read of the golden age that follows immediately after the shutting up of Satan that we just read about in verse 21 and 22. For the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his elders gloriously, we read in verse 23. Now the location of the incarceration. Satan is incarcerated in the bottomless pit or the abyss. Or the Greek is abyssos. Peter and um, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4 we read, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. We see Satan being bound with chains. Uh, Satan being incarcerated in the bottomless pit. And that is the location of his incarceration. The bound Satan is incarcerated in an unbound pit. This is not the lake of fire, but a temporary prison house where Satan and his emissaries are bound awaiting the final judgment day. What is the purpose of, of Satan's binding now, you would ask? And that is where uh, we come about in the millennial reign of Christ. There can be no millennial reign or no millennial period or no thousand year period until Satan is bound. And we read in this passage in Revelation chapter 20 that he should deceive the nations no more. And that is the purpose. The millennial age is to be the age in which divine righteousness is to be displayed without any external influences of Satan and his foes. What a day that will be. The millennial period would be God's final test of fallen humanity under the most ideal circumstances. All outward sources of temptation must be removed so that man will demonstrate what he is apart from Satan's external influences. What a time period that will be. Think about it. The kingdom of God uh, with Satan incarcerated. Uh, what is that going to look like? With Satan being bound, what is the kingdom of God going to look like? The Old Testament sheds so much light into this kingdom. First and foremost, there can be no earthly theocratic kingdom apart from the personal manifestation of the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. First and foremost, he is called Jehovah's servant, the branch in Zechariah, the Lord of hosts, the tender plant. He will in that day be king and judge and lawgiver. If you read in Malachi, he is the son of righteousness. He is the stone. He is the light. The millennial 
will be a period or uh, will be a period of the full manifestation of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. It will be everything about the King, our Lord Jesus Christ. There will be a manifestation of the glory associated with the humanity of Christ. There will be the glory of the of, of his glorious dominion in which Christ by the virtue of his obedience unto death is given a universal dominion to replace the dominion which Adam lost. There will be the glory of a glorious government in which Christ, as the son of David, is given absolute power to govern. One of my favorite portions in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, and we often read this, we read like this in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, very familiar, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice, from that time forward, even forever, the seal of the Lord of hosts will proclaim, will per perform it, sorry. And he will sit as king on the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it, to establish it, to bring forth judgment and justice forever and ever. There will be the glory of a glorious inheritance. The millennial period, uh, uh, in the millennial period, there will be the glory of a glorious inheritance in which the land and the seed promised to Abraham by the Lord God of heaven are realized through Christ Jesus. There will be the glory of a glorious judiciary uh, in which Christ as the spokesman of God, for God, announces God's will and law throughout the age. He will be the perfect judge. There will be the glory of a glorious house and throne in which Christ, as David's son, shall fulfill that promise, that promise to David through the prophet Nathan. The glory of a glorious house and throne there will be the glory of a glorious kingdom over which Christ shall reign. And we read that in Psalm chapter 72. The kingdom will be characterized by righteousness. The son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. The kingdom will be characterized by obedience. The tree was placed in the Garden of Eden as a test of obedience. With the disobedience of man, God did not surrender his purpose of bringing all things into subjection to himself. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10, we read that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him. The kingdom will be characterized by holiness. In Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 20 and 21, we read, In that day, holiness to the Lord shall be engraved on the bells of the horses. <laughs> what a day that will be. The kingdom will be characterized by truth. In Zechariah chapter 4, 8 verse 3, in Zechariah 8 and verse 3, we read like this, Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion and dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth. The kingdom, the millennial kingdom, will be characterized by the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Now, I love this thought. It will be characterized by the fullness of the Holy Spirit. In, in the book of Ephesians, we read, uh, Do not be filled with wine, uh, but be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, but again, uh, we live in the flesh, and there are times when we act fleshly and not in the spirit. But in, in the kingdom age, uh, the kingdom will be characterized by the absolute perfect fullness of the Holy Spirit. 
In Joel chapter 2, verse 28 to 29, we read like this, And it shall come to pass afterward, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Has that ever happened? Uh, pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy, shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. The kingdom will be characterized by peace. There will be cessation of war uh, through the unification of the kingdom of the world under the sovereign reign of Christ, wherein there will be peace and everlasting peace. The kingdom will be characterized by no sickness. There will be no cancer, no heart attacks, no arthritis, no depression. Ezekiel chapter 34 and verse 16, we read like this, And the inhabitants will not say, I am sick. The people who dwell in it will be forgiven their iniquity. This kingdom, the millennial kingdom, will be characterized by freedom from oppression. There will be no social, no political, or religious oppression in that day. The kingdom will be characterized by perfect justice uh, to every individual. In Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 1 to 4 we read, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him and he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. And we go on to read, uh, he will bring forth justice for truth till he has established justice in the earth. So, if you have come to this point uh, in, in the recording today, in the message today, uh, you have a homework. I would uh, request, uh, if, if you may, uh, to look at verses in the Old Testament uh, that, that presents a characteristic of the Millennial Kingdom. It can be a characteristic that we have looked at today uh, or something new that I did not present today from the Word uh, from any of the Old Testament passages. Uh, post your answers to the notes and the email that goes out with this link uh, and, and share it with the saints. Uh, and let's see uh, what comes out of that. Moving on, uh, the reign of the saints. So we see from uh, in, in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4 onwards through, the, uh, through verse 6, we see the reign of the saints. In Matthew chapter 19, uh, you know, uh, well, in this passage in Revelation chapter 20, uh, we read of those who are judging on thrones. Who are those that are sitting and judging on, ju on thrones? I saw thrones. Uh, and they that sat on them, judgment was committed to them. Who are these? Uh, we read in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 28. Um, you can read that when you get a chance. Uh, we see the Lord Jesus Christ telling the apostles uh, that they will be sitting on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. We read in Luke chapter 22 verse 29 to 30. Uh, we read there uh, Jesus Christ again saying, I will bestow upon you, the apostles, a kingdom, just as my father bestowed one upon me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 to 3, we read, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? The sitters upon these thrones are priests of God and of Christ, and they shall reign with him for a thousand years. These constitute Christ's royal priests, for you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own peculiar people, is what we read in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. Those whom he has made a kingdom of priests. And so these reigning with Christ Jesus uh, in this passage is the church. 
Now, we also read about the tribulation saints in this passage in Revelation chapter 20. We read, uh, And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. A second group here reigns with Christ besides the church. And these are the tribulation saints, or, or them that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ during the tribulation period. These tribulation saints who were martyred for the cause of Christ, who did not worship uh, the beast or receive the mark of the beast on them. In verse 5 of Revelation chapter 20, we read, But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. We see here the first resurrection, uh, and uh, alluding to the first resurrection, a second resurrection, we see uh, the second death as well. There are two different kinds of resurrection programs anticipated in God's resurrection program, I would uh, commit to you. The resurrection of life, as we read in John chapter 5, I am the resurrection, I am the life. Uh, or the resurrection, or the first resurrection, as, uh, as we also read in the New Testament, or the resurrection of the just. Uh, uh, and we also read about it in Hebrews chapter 11 verses 35 as a better resurrection. And then there is a second resurrection. And, and this is the resurrection unto judgment. And this second resurrection leads to the second death. And the second resurrection does not happen until the thousand years are complete. And we will look at it uh, next week, Lord willing, by Brother Mike Eiffel. The first resurrection that is uh, uh, spoken of here. Uh, we read in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 to 24. Uh, I'm not going to read that passage. You can read it at your own time. Uh, we read of Christ. Christ was the first one raised from the dead with a resurrection body, right? Uh, up from the grave, he arose uh, as a mighty triumph over his foes. Um, Christ, he is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, is what we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The word resurrection is almost always in the New Testament translated as bodily resurrection. At the end of the church age, when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and the rapture of the church will take place and the dead in Christ will be raised. And at the end of the tribulation, the tribulation saints will also be raised from the dead. So the first resurrection uh, that is talked about here in Revelation chapter 20, refers to an order of resurrection which includes all the righteous who are raised from the dead before the millennial kingdom begins. Just like Satan has to be bound before the millennial kingdom uh, begins, uh, the saints have to be resurrected. Uh, the saints in Christ will be resurrected. Uh, them uh, that are saints uh, that are believing uh, saints unto him from the tribulation period, they will be raised as well uh, to reign with Christ in the millennial kingdom. The first is in contrast to the those that are raised last or those that are raised second after the millennial kingdom separated by a thousand years when the wicked will be raised unto judgment before the white throne judgment seat. Those who take part in the first resurrection, regardless of when their resurrection happens, they are called blessed and holy. They are delivered from the power of the second death. The second death cannot have any power over them that are part of the first resurrection. They are given a special status of priests of God and of Christ and are privileged to reign with Christ Jesus for a thousand years. So, we see the three things that John saw here in this passage. 
uh, relating to the thousand year period. He saw the angel coming down, binding Satan. He saw thrones and them that sat on them, the church. He saw the souls of those who were martyred for the witness of Christ Jesus. He saw the saints uh, from the first resurrection, priests and kings, that is the church and, uh, and the saints, the souls of those who were martyred for the witness of Christ, reigning together as priests and kings under God for a thousand years. What a blessed day that will be when we will be with Christ through all eternity, when we shall reign with Him. Uh, let us renew our hopes uh, in knowing that this is not our home, but that day is coming when we shall be with Him. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for redeeming our souls. We thank you, Father God, for the kingdom plan that you had even before the foundations of the world were laid. Father, we are a people who have sinned against you, uh, who have rebelled against you time and again, but yet you, through the seed of the woman, redeemed us, bought us with your own blood, through the blood of, of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and made us a kingdom of priests unto you. Father, we look forward to that day when righteousness will reign, when there will be the perfect lawgiver and perfect justice, when there will be no sickness and no pain, reigning with you forever and ever. Father, we look forward to that day until then. Help us, Lord, to renew our hope, looking unto you, the author and perfecter of our faith. Help us, Lord, to be strengthened in you and by you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your kingdom plan that you have revealed to us through your word uh, that strengthens our hearts uh, and renews our hope. We give you thanks for your son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and his precious name we pray. Amen.